Ben King is such a beautiful, beautiful song. Thanks for leading us so well. One of my favorites. Well, it's lovely to see you, church family. It is a joy to be with you. And if you are visiting with us, we warmly, warmly welcome you this morning. We have finished summer. Uh, March 1st rolled around very quick, and so summer's gone, but may the long days and nice weather last as long as it can. And we finished up our summer in the Psalms, and before we jump back into the Gospel of John, I wanted to take just this unique little Sunday um, before heading off to the States later on this afternoon to share a message to share a message. Um, sermons are give on, given on the Lord's Day. Lectures are not to be given on the Lord's Day. Sermons are to be preached on the Lord's Day. They say when you take a lecture and a sermon and you smash it together, you get a lerman. And lermans are okay. They have their, they have their uh, fitting and appropriate time. I was wondering, what is today? I'll call it a perman. It's a permen, it's a pastoral at word between you and I and God in His Word. Um, It won't be a regular sermon, I don't think, that you're used to here on the Lord's Day. But I pray that God, by His Spirit, uses His Word to work in all of our lives. We're considering the topic of spiritual gifts and employing those spiritual gifts today. I would love... For you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. We're kind of going to be looking all around Ephesians today. And Danielle read our passage uh, by God's providence uh, that we'll look at today. And so I invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. And I want to begin reading in verse 8. And as we've begun doing this year, I want to invite you to Stand with me for the reading of God's holy and inerrant and sufficient word. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. God says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. May God bless the reading of His Word. You may have a seat. I remember years ago now, it's probably nine years ago now, we started a men's leadership group and we kicked that off and the elders kind of handed that over to me, and the first book we went through was a book by Kevin DeYoung called Crazy Busy, Crazy Busy. It might still be available at the bookstore there. You might need it after today's message. <laughs> and I remember just having on my heart seeing a lot of the people in our church incredibly busy. Kevin DeYoung obviously observed that too, and he wrote a book about it. And it's a great book, it's a little book. And I can remember as we walked through that, some of the men were like, but, but what, are you, what, what are we meant to do with this? I have, I have so much on my plate, you're saying that I need to take this away and this away and this away? I said, no, let's just look very carefully at what Kevin had to say. And the basic idea is that we want to be careful that we're not busy about all the wrong things. Churches can get in trouble when you just fill your calendar with things that are outside the philosophy of the church. And any good church ought to have as its philosophy the advancement of the equipping of the saints and the evangelization of the lost, just in the most basic nutshell. Anything that falls outside of that is counterproductive and crazy busy. Well, may we be crazy blessed, if you'd allow me to say that, as we consider this topic this morning and we begin to think through this. And as we consider the topic and the concept of identifying and then employing our spiritual gifts, that's the heart today. 
is beginning to see how we can identify and employ our spiritual gifts in this local church. And one of the reasons for this message this morning is it's been on my heart and I know the heart of my fellow elders is that there is a bunch of new people here at this church. Then there are those people that have been here a long time and then there's those people who, uh, I don't know the other category, but you don't say those that are just moments away from glory, but um, there's perhaps some like that. Lord willing, I arrived safely in Los Angeles and that's not me. Um, but what, what we what we have is you, you have sometimes people that are really, they, they, they're fired up, they've met the Lord, and then they just want to get stuck in. And then sometimes you have people who, who have known the Lord for a long time, but they find themselves, for whatever reason or whatever season, they're in a spiritual grout. That they were busy serving the Lord, and then something happened in their life, X, Y, or Z, and they have gone into this spiritual slump, this, this, this drought. There's all different kinds of people here today. And so, we want to consider identifying and employing, or let me say this, rekindling. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote to young Timothy, and he said, kindle, spark the gift that is within you. Rekindle that gift that is within you. And so, we're going to do so under four uh, immense realities four immense realities that are ours, that we've received from Jesus Christ, so that we can live out our salvation in a more tangible, a more purposeful way, to the praise of God's glory and grace. And so, we'll just walk through some things together. If you're taking notes, I want to tell you that we'll see first, number one, the reality that you have received salvation. You have received salvation salvation. Second, we'll see the reality that you have received a spiritual gift. You've received a spiritual gift. And then third, the reality that you've received a role, a role. And then fourth and final reality is that you have received an opportunity, received an opportunity. And so I just want to begin to walk through this permanent, this pastoral address to you where we'll just kind of walk through together under this first heading you have received a salvation the bible is uh, god's word to us about his redemption of his people his redemption of his people if you're here this morning and you have looked to christ and all it takes is a look look to christ for salvation believing in his atoning sacrificial death on your behalf for your sin and in His glorious resurrection, if you've believed in the Lord Jesus, then you have received the salvation. You are one of His people. Remarkably, Ephesians 2, I trust your Bible is still open there. You know this verse very well. Verse 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Verse 2, in which you formerly walked, to walk is to live. You, you and I walk every day, we live, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. You and I were born spiritually dead. You and I know this, we believe in the doctrines of grace, that a spiritually dead person can respond to nothing but divine stimuli. You understand that, right? A spiritually dead person, which is all of humanity outside of the Lord Jesus, can only respond to divine stimuli. Sovereign grace. Sovereign grace. And so, it's immense, isn't it? When, when you and I take a moment to think about where we've come from. Some of you were raised in a Christian home, and that's great. Some of you were raised in a non-Christian home, and that's also great because you're here as a trophy of God's sovereign grace. And when you and I, regardless of where we came from, consider what we were and what we now have become by God's grace... It warms our heart. When I get to watch your faces as the saints come and give their testimonies during baptism, 
you don't necessarily get to see everyone else's face. You can if you look around, and I encourage you to do that. But I get to watch all your faces as the testimonies are given, and they light up. They light up. Why do they light up? Because you're rejoicing in what has happened in their life because you know that it happened in your life, and you know the blessing it is to be a saint. You and I have received a salvation We were children of wrath. Then look at verse 4. You know this verse very well. But God, but God, being what? Rich in mercy. And then this next phrase, you could study this for the rest of your life. Because of His great love, noun, with which He loved us, verb. His great love with which He loved us. Look, even when, verse 5, we were dead, just, just in case you had forgot that you were spiritually dead, not sick, dead, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, and then in parentheses, by grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. I want you to look again at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved. (laughs) God knows the propensity of the human heart to always be looking and finding anywhere, anywhere and in the Bible, man determining his own salvation. And so God just repeatedly says here over and over, for by grace you have been saved, for by grace you have been saved. And then he even says, look at the middle of verse 8, and not And that not of yourselves. In case you forgot that too. It's not of yourselves. And then this beautiful phrase here. Look, in in your Bibles, it is, the words it is should be in italics. It is, then it says, the gift of God. It is is not in the original Greek. It's added there just to give it a smooth flow. And what the Greek grammar is conveying there is that both grace and faith is a gift. You and I could do nothing to to, to, to receive salvation. We have received salvation. What a remarkable, remarkable truth. I hope that warms your heart that you are unlike the vast majority of people that you come into contact with during the week. That doesn't make you any better than them because it's by grace and not of yourself. It doesn't make us have glee that they are on their way to the judgment of God unless they repent and we're not. No, no, it warms our heart that God the Father showered us with such undeserving grace and love that we wake up on Sunday morning and drive to church and sing songs and pray and sit under sermons and have joy in our heart when we go through trial. We're different. Why? Because we've received something outside of ourselves. We've received salvation. Yes, thank you for saying amen. Someone else say it. Thank you. Number one, you have received salvation. Never, ever forget that. Number two, you've received a gift. You have received a gift. Our salvation is a spiritual reality. I mean, we are spiritual people. We're not spiritualists like pagans, but we are spiritual, true worshippers true worshippers. Our salvation is a spiritual reality. It's poured out in us. It's poured out upon us by the Holy Spirit. When, get this, when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. One-time event. One-time event. If you think there's two baptisms of the Holy Spirit, come talk to me later. There's one. There's one. Regeneration. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is, as I said, a one-time event where we are placed into union with the Lord Jesus Christ by faith and we receive all of His benefits, all of His blessings. All that is His between the Father and the Son becomes ours because we're placed into union with Him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 
Well, 1 Corinthians says this, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. You thought about that before? Interesting way to put it. We were all made to drink of one Spirit. We're all one. We all serve as one. We live as one. We're united to the one. We're one. We're baptized into one body, the church. And so salvation has come to us. Salvation has been poured out upon us. And so too, when we receive salvation, we receive as a gift of grace our spiritual gifts. Our spiritual gifts. I want you to look at verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 3. As you have your Bibles open, I trust there. Paul says there that he was made a minister. He was made one. According to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me, he says. According to the working of his power. When did we receive our gifts? When we were regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God. But get this. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who having ascended back to the Father after His resurrection, He's the one who showers His people with spiritual gifts. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, I want you to look at verse 8 of Ephesians 4. Verse 8. Therefore, it says, when he, that's the Lord Jesus, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives. And look at this. And he gave gifts to men. He gave spiritual gifts to his people, is what that's saying. And so once Christ had done the work, he was sent by God the Father to do. And praise God, he did it perfectly. That is, the purchasing of our salvation, Christ then distributed gifts to His people. Every single one of His people. You say, well, how can you say that? Well, look up at verse 7 of Ephesians 4. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of of Christ's gift. The word grace there is the word gift. This is not talking about saving grace. This is a talking about serving grace. But to each one of us, a gift was given according to the what? The measure of Christ's gift. He's the one who gives the gifts. And so both the salvation of a people... And the specific spiritual gifts for the people all come from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you where else they come from. They come from before the world was. We often think of our salvation before the world was. Well, we're going to look again at Ephesians 2.10, which tells us that not only was there salvation for a people before the world was, there were specific gifts prepared and planned before the world was. And so the Holy Spirit's the author of the spiritual gifts, the Son is the distributor of those spiritual gifts. But for what express purpose are these spiritual gifts given? Well, as you know, we are gifted spiritual gifts so that we can each play our role in the building up of the body of Christ, which is the church expressed in local churches all over the world, just like ours here at Riverbend. So that Jesus Christ would fill all things for His glory. All things. For his glory. I want you to look 
at verse 10 of Ephesians 4. We just looked at verse 8. Here's verse 10. He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens. Look what it says at the end. So that he might fill all things. That he might fill all things. What does that mean? That his glory might be everywhere. That his glory might be on display everywhere. Primarily through the people of God inside the church, serving one another and preaching the gospel. And here's how he does it. Look at verse 11. He gave some, gave, gift. He gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Until, verse 13, we all attain to the unity of the faith, that is the content of the faith, the doctrine, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, verse 14, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. And so, what Paul, by the Spirit of God, is conveying there is that everyone receives a gift, and then there are specific gifts that God gives to the church. There's five of them listed there. There's apostles and prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers. They are given to the church as gifts to equip the people in the church, the saints, so that we all, pastor, evangelist, and teacher, and saint, so that we all do the work of the ministry together to the building up of the body of Christ. And so, we understand that the Holy Spirit is the author of the gifts. We understand that Christ is the distributor of those spiritual gifts, having been, the me- having been made the mediator for us. And therefore, when we think of all of that, we need to just tuck away the words of John Owen, the Puritan John Owen. We need to just tuck these away in our mind. He said this quote, the spiritual gifts are neither natural nor moral. Their author is the Holy Spirit, their nature is spiritual, and they exercise spiritual things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, it says that the spiritual gifts that we have been given are, and I quote, a manifestation of the Spirit. A manifestation of the Spirit. What that means is that the Spirit forms and fashions the spiritual gifts. Christ is given authority by the Father as mediator to then distribute the gifts so that, get this, the presence and power of God the Spirit would be seen. Now, in times past, that's been done by extraordinary signs and wonders. 2 Corinthians 12, 12 says that the signs of an apostle, the signs of an apostle is signs and wonders. In times past, there's been this extraordinary signs and wonders gift set, if you will, in that unique validating ministry of the Lord Jesus where Christ sent out the apostles and prophets in those days of old. But in these days, in these days, we're told in Hebrews chapter 1 that there were days spoken of of old where God spoke through prophets and apostles and miracle workers and in many different ways, but in these days, it says in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 that God speaks through His Son, the Lord Jesus. Why? Because the Son who has now ascended, He now gives gifts, spiritual gifts, still full of the power and presence of the Spirit, but they are not sign gifts or 
miraculous revelatory gifts as they are called, but now gives more ordinary yet still supernatural and still spiritual gifts to build up the church, equip the saints and advance the gospel. All that to say, there were gifts in times gone by that are no longer around for today. They were extraordinary. Now they are somewhat ordinary. And that's why the church for the last hundreds and hundreds of years has referred to the ordinary means of grace. God accomplishes great things through ordinary means, but they are still very much spirit-empowered, spirit-present, supernatural means. Okay, we see the theological facts. God gives gifts to His people. We all have a gift or a set of gifts so that Christ can fill all things with His glory. And the church can advance in her mission by God. But I bet you're asking, what are the gifts that we are given? What are the gifts that we are given? Well, as I said, during the time of Christ on earth, He sent out apostles. They worked miraculous signs and wonders. They did this, Ephesians 2 verse 20 tells us, to build a foundation. Build a foundation. Once that foundation has been built, those extraordinary miraculous sign gifts, like an individual possessing the gift of healing or prophecy or tongues is done away with, because you only ever have one foundation in a building. And then we're told that we build upon that foundation with our gifts, revealed in more ordinary ways. And yet, as I said, and I want to stress, still full of the Holy Spirit, His presence and His Power. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, it says this, There are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And so what are the gifts for the church, for Riverbend Bible Church today? What are they? Well, let me give them to you in a list as they're revealed to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and 1 Peter chapter 4. You don't have to write these down. You can listen to them. You can write them down if you want, but I'm just going to say them. This is what the gifts set is available for any saint today. Administration. Administration. Discernment. Evangelism. Although I want to qualify that one. Exhortation. Faith. Giving. Helps. Hospitality. Leadership. Mercy, serving, preaching and teaching and wisdom. That's a list of present day gifts that Christ gives to His people, the church today. He gives to every saint here at Riverbend Bible Church one or a few of those gifts. So that the saints are equipped, the gospel is proclaimed and the body is built. And so that Christ fills all things with His glory. That's the list. Now what? Now what? Well, everyone has a gift. Some, most, have more than one. I want you to listen to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. It says this. It's a command, actually. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards, listen to this, of God's varied grace. That's how the ESV puts it. NASB puts it manifold grace. It's just varied grace. God distributes a variety of gifts. Now, I know full well that a few things begin to happen when we talk about gifts. Some people want to debate whether or not the spirit, the revelatory sign gifts are still in operation or whether they have ceased. Park that conversation for another day. But this is what generally happens. Number one, someone, many people, some of us will say, number one, I don't know what my gift or gifts are. Number one. And number two, 
even if I do know or come to find out what they are as a result of this sermon today, I don't see any need around this church for me or my gift. And so what am I to do? I think that probably sums up what most people think about using spiritual gifts today. I don't know what my gifts or gifts are. And even if I do know, I don't see any place for them. People are already doing it. I don't really see anything. What am I to do? Well, I'm so glad that you're here. And so let's walk through this together. First, I don't know what my gift or gifts are. I want you to know that's very common. There are people serving in this church who, who, who know what their gifts are and they've known for a long time and they're using their gifts. But there's a bunch of people, you, you don't know what your gifts are. I don't know what my gifts are. It's very common. You think about it, we don't receive a card or an app that says, hello, my name's Joe and this is your gift. I have the gift of X, Y or Z. But I do fear that that experience of not knowing what your gift or gifts are is something that we live in longer than we need to. We kind of just push it to the side and we just live in that space much longer than we need to and much longer than we ought to. Because we just kind of leave it alone, we don't take the time to press in on it, we don't take the time to take it seriously, but that's not what God calls us to. He calls us to take up our gift, use that gift as we just read from 1 Peter 4 and serving others with it in response to His gift of saving grace to us. We must always understand that we are not saved by works, we are saved what? For works. And so... You think about it, He ransomed us by denying Himself for us. We ought, should we not, be motivated to deny ourselves, find our gift and employ it in service for His name and for His glory. And so here's how we ought to do that. Because there has to be some practical steps that I give you. First, you have to be convinced in your mind that when God's Word says each Christian has a gift, that that is true and that means you. That that has to be a conviction formed in your heart. Do you know that each time spiritual gifts are mentioned to us in the Bible, literally, there is this little divinely inspired Greek word. Hekastos, hekastos, and it means each, every, each and every person has received the gift, there's no exception, every Christian, that's you. And so first, be convinced every Christian has been grace gifted, a spiritual gift, and that includes you. Second, you actually need to take the time to study what the gifts are. I gave you the list, I email out my sermon notes each week, I'll try and recall to have Debbie, or at least she's so great, she'll message me and say, can you please provide me that list? I'll have Debbie provide you that list somewhere for you this week in case it's helpful. You, you need to second study that list, read the list, and not just read the list, you need to look at the ways each of those gifts then plays out in the life of a local church, namely your church, Riverbend Bible Church. I'll give you an example. You may be a very sensitive person in a good way. You can be sensitive in a bad way, but you may be a very sensitive person in a good way, very merciful and compassionate. You, you may have seen over time that God has a particular pattern of laying upon your heart a heart for those that are lonely and those that are needy in our congregation. Then you look into how that kind of gift functions or ought function in our church. And by the way, if you see a glaring hole in mercy ministry in our church, 
then you plug that hole by your gifting. And so maybe there's people here today where you're thinking, yeah, the Lord does lay on my heart a desire for those that are lonely. I'll tell you, there's lonely people in our church. There's lonely people. There's people who don't hear from people for weeks and weeks at a time. There's lonely people. Third, you've got to pray. You have to pray. You have to pray like the Apostle Paul, that God would open the eyes of your heart and mind. Pray about it to, to see what He has laid on your heart as a gift. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 says, pursue love. That's great. That's necessary. And it says this, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. Pursue love and yet earnestly desire to know and to employ your spiritual gift. Fifth, and this one is kind of important. I just wrote here, give it a go. Just give it a go. I think I may have uh, the gift of helps mentioned earlier in 1 Peter chapter 4 in the list I gave you. I think so because I look into what the gift of helps mean. I, I study the list. I, I go to my Bible. And then I discover that the gift of helps means the gift of providing practical help to a fellow believer in this church so that they can be freed up to minister their gift to other saints. That's what the gift of helps is. And so maybe God lays that on my heart, and then I, I, I reach out into it, and I press into that gift, and I see how it goes. Now, with any of the gifts, don't ever expect perfection, because within the gift sets themselves is a degree of giftedness. I mean, I am a, I, I am a brown belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. My kids always ask me, when are you getting your black belt? When are you getting your black belt? Well, you need four tips on a belt. I've got two of them. Lord willing, we're going away on a sabbatical for a number of months, so I won't be around, so it'll take me longer and longer. But I'm 41 years old, and by God's grace, I'll be X when I get my black belt. There's black belts and there's black belts. Like, uh, uh, you know me, I'm not super strong and athletic. There's levels to things in whatever set there is, is what I'm trying to convey. So don't get discouraged when, you know, you, you believe God's given you this gift and you're serving in this way, but then there's someone else that excels more. The Bible has a lot to say, doesn't it, about the damage that's been caused when you look to someone with a gift set and they're better than you, quote unquote, and you get envious and jealous, doesn't it? There's a lot of problems that have been caused in a church in that way. Don't expect perfection. Just see how it goes. Give it a go. I was told many years ago by f former pastors and mentors, and I've used this, it just works with me. You need one hand of the plow and the other hand saying, yep, I I I'd like to serve in that way. Now, you don't drown. You don't sacrifice your family on the altar of serving. You don't do those things. But that's a general principle. Put your hand to the plow, put your hand up and say, yeah, I'd like to serve in that way. And read Kevin DeYoung's book, Crazy Busy, so you find the balance that's necessary. Sixth, just very gently, don't run ahead of the church elders. But good elders will always be desirous of seeing people use their gifts. But just by the nature of it, there's often a careful path towards who leads and serves in various ministries. If, if something is kind of outside the philosophy of the church, then, you know, there'll be other discussions. But, you know, if you come to me, and, and many have you come to me over the years asking me to want to start a ministry, I'm the kind of person that just says, go for it, sounds great. If you need any resources, let me know. That, that's just the way I'm wired. It's just, it's just I, I love seeing the Lord work through His people. Ministries in churches are not perpetual. Ministries start up, ministries go. They come and go as the Lord uses them for a time, but the spiritual gifts remain. God's people have in their heart a desire to serve God's people because they know that God's glory is revealed and displayed when people are using their gifts. Because remember the express purpose of the gifts? It says it. We read it. 
that Christ would fill all things with his glory. You're doing well. Lecture, sermon, sermon, permon, whatever this is, you know, you're doing well. And so you've received the salvation, you've received the gift, they're two immense realities. So what? Now what? Well, here's what. The salvation and the spiritual gift we have received means, number three, very quickly, that you've received a role. You have received a role. I want you to go back to Ephesians 2.10. We are His workmanship. God is a creator God. Conveying the idea that God creates creation, ex nihilo, out of nothing. God forms and fashions rebellious hearts and creates new people, His people. We are His workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus. We're in union with Christ for good works, for acts of service, for the employing of our spiritual gift. That's what we were created for. Which God prepared beforehand. It's the whole idea of salvation was before time began, it was planned, our gifts were planned. It's like, I'm going to save Tim and I'm going to give Tim this gift or this gift set. That's the eternal, dare I speak like that regarding the intra- Trinitarian plan of God, but that's between Father and Son and Spirit. They plan we're going to save Tim, and Tim's going to have these gifts. And then down through time, Christ comes, He lives a perfect life, He dies a perfect death, rises victorious, the Holy Spirit comes down through time and applies the new birth, the salvation, and the gift set into Tim's life, and every single one of your life as well. God's blueprint is perfect. It's perfect. You've received a role. You know, there's a component to spiritual gifts that we need to understand, and I want to tell you this. When the Apostle Paul writes about gifts, whether in Romans chapter 12, verse 6, or 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he writes that Christians have, he uses the word have gifts, the Greek word echo. There's two little Greek words today that are very important. This one here, echo, means have. Christians have gifts, which means we possess our gifts. And that implies that the gift we possess has been endowed upon us. Endowed upon us. To be endowed with something means to be given something of significance, right? You think of hospitals, you think of universities, you think of colleges and the like. They are often endowed incredibly large sums of money. And when you receive an incredibly large amount of money, when you're a hospital, a college, an organization, you are what? You are then responsible to be good stewards of that money. Well, a spiritual gift is far more significant and far more pertinent and far more powerful and purposeful than even the largest endowment of money you could ever receive. You have received through Christ's perfect life a spiritual gift. It's been endowed upon you and I. And as has been well said, Where the master entrusts some of his resources to his servant, there really must be a grasping of the importance of the stewardship we must make of our gifts. Christ is God and King. We are his subjects. King Jesus gives us gifts and we need to be good stewards. Now I want to say something here. There are precious saints here and I see you and you have devoted your life to serving and you've reaped the rewards. Some of you are so sweet in the sense that you've had the gift of hospitality for years but your body is 
frail now and you can no longer do that and it breaks your heart. You, you don't feel the push of this message today. Here's what I want to say to anyone like that. Is rest well. But keep telling us younger ones the joy that is found in using your gifts. You have a role. He places you in a church. He affords you a vital role in a church. Each local church has very real strengths and weaknesses. Each local church has very serious gaps to fill. There's a role for you because there is a gift for you. And this is the church for you. Lastly, very quickly, you have received an opportunity. What do I mean by that? Well, you've received an opportunity to gather up treasure in heaven. You've received an opportunity to establish your eternal reward. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, Blessed are you when people insult you, and they will, and persecute you, and they will, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, and they will. He said this, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14 says, If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward eternal rewards. I need you to understand this. Eternal rewards are not some extra jewel in a crown. They are spiritual rewards to us, joy, life, righteousness, worship. Eternal rewards are defined by this. In heaven's glory, you will have a greater capacity for worship. Every saint in glory will receive fullness because there'll be no sorrow and discouragement in heaven's glory. But there will be a larger capacity of that fullness of worship and capacity for worship for those who have served using their gifts well. John Flavel, he said this, quote, Whoever denied himself for Christ as Christ denied himself for us. He asked the question, whoever denied himself for Jesus Christ, like Christ denied himself for us. Feel the weight of that. When you think of eternal rewards, you've got to understand this. The spiritual gifts we are given are ours solely by grace. Grace. The works we perform, you employing our spiritual gifts, are solely by grace. Therefore, the eternal rewards are nothing that we merit. They are solely by grace. Dr. Beakey taught me that. It's beautiful. I read these words early this week. I'm leaving for a week so the Sunday school teachers can't write me a, a, well, they can write me an email still for going over time. Not that they do that anyway, but sorry, I'll just, just give me a minute. I read these words earlier this week, quote, once it was the blessing, now it is the Lord. Once it was the feeling, now it is the word. Once his gifts I wanted, now the giver own. Once I sought for healing, now himself alone. They're beautiful words. Isaiah 64 verse 8 says, but now, O Yahweh, you are our father, we are the clay, and you our potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. Created to be employed to use our gifts. If you are here and you're a Christian, you have been given a gift. May what we consider today help you to identify and even fan into flame those gifts. And if you're not here 
as a Christian today, then I just have one thing to say. That unless you turn to Christ, you will perish and all your earthly gifts will perish with you. But out of his great love, God sent forth his son. And if you believe in him, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. Next Lord's Day, Lord willing, there'll be a ministry fair where you can see all the areas in the life of this church. And maybe, just maybe, God by His Spirit will take this message today and help us to not get crazy busy, but to be crazy blessed. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in your word It is very easy to lose sight of Jesus while we pursue our spiritual gifts. Spare us from that. Spare us, Lord, from making our spiritual gifts an idol. Don't allow any of this, Lord, to take our eye off the Lord Jesus, the only one who matters. Help us to remember that we're not saved in any way by good works, but that we are saved for good works. Thank you, Father, that you've not only prepared a people, but you've prepared works that we would walk in. Would you, by your Holy Spirit, in the way that only you can apply the truth of this message to the hearts of your people, we thank you that we get to experience so much. We look forward now to experiencing baptisms. You're so kind to us, Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Lord willing, I'll see you when I'm back from the Shepherds Conference. Haven't been there for four years. Looking forward to that. Thank you. And uh, let's make our way over to the pool and we'll baptize some saints.